Okay, so today we are going to talk about the structure and function of the cells. And as you can see here, we have a few different examples for you to look at. So we're going to talk about cell theory, we're going to talk about cell size, we're going to talk about some microscopy, we're going to talk about prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells, we're going to compare them, and then we're also going to compare plant cells versus animal cells. So, cell theory is kind of a combination of work from different scientists. So, in the 1660s, Hooke coined the term cell to describe life's basic unit. Then, Schleiden in 1838 studied plant cells. Schwann in 1839 studied animal cells. And in 1858, Virchow did some experiments that allowed him to show that cells were actually capable of self-reproduction. So, the cell theory contains three tenets. First, the cell is a basic structural and functional unit of life. So that basically means that the cell is the smallest structure that can perform all of the functions required for life. So life begins at the cell, in other words. All living things are made up of cells is the second thing. So again, if something is considered living, it's going to be made up of cells. We talked about the characteristics of living things versus non-living things. So those living things are all going to be made up of cells. And the last one is new cells arise only from pre-existing cells. So that means that cells aren't going to spontaneously just pop up. They have to come from pre-existing cells. Cells also have to remain small because otherwise they can't function effectively. A large surface area to volume ratio allows the cell to function properly and effectively because you have to remember that cells need to get things in, like nutrients, and they also have to get waste products out. So if the nutrients or waste have too far to go, the cell is going to die before it gets there. So it has to maintain that surface area to volume ratio. As the volume increases or the cell size increases, the surface area does not increase proportionately. So they have to have that large surface area compared to volume. So as the cell increases in size, that surface area to volume ratio decreases because as I said, the surface area and the volume do not increase proportionately. So cells have to remain small so that they have more plasma membrane to cytoplasm. So they need enough surface area, which the plasma membrane provides, in order to get things in and out effectively, in a nutshell. So in a smaller cell, the communication and control is going to be more effective. The nucleus, which is the control center of the cell, can only control so much cytoplasm. So the plasma membrane can only regulate so much material in and out of the cell. So maintaining this ratio is extremely important for effective functioning. So you can see as an object grows larger, its volume increases a lot more rapidly than its surface area. So therefore, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. So if you look at that one millimeter cube, the surface area to volume ratio is six to one. But then if you look at that two millimeter cube, the surface area to volume ratio is three to one. And if you go to four millimeters, which is just doubling the size every time, you go down to one and a half to one. So a way to effectively be larger and still be effective would be to add folds. So if you would cut that four millimeter cube into squares, then you'd have more surface area to get things in and out of the cell. So what we'll find is that a lot of cells have folds in order to increase their surface area. Mitochondria, for example, have folds to increase their surface area for ATP production. Our stomach has folds to increase our surface area for absorption. The small intestine has folds to increase the surface area for absorption. So folds are going to be something that you will see, especially if you go on to A&P anatomy. 
So this is why large organisms have to be multicellular as opposed to a few really big cells. We have a couple of exceptions. Cells that specialize in absorption need to have that large surface area. So as I was saying, when you have like the small intestine, 90% of absorption takes place in the small intestine. So they're gonna add folds so that they can have that extra surface area. Neurons, of course, are our nerve cells, and this is how our brain communicates with the rest of our body. And bird eggs. The ovum of a chicken has a very small amount of cytoplasm surrounded by a huge amount of yolk, and it's surrounded by a single cytoplasmic membrane, so increasing that surface area for absorption. Microscopy allows us to look at very small cells that we can't see with the naked eye. So this chart shows you what we can see with the human eye, which is down to about a human egg. What we can see with a light microscope, which is probably the most, the lowest level of microscopes you can get. And that's what we usually have in labs. But we can see most bacteria down to chloroplasts. But if you want to get smaller than that, if you want to look at organelles and things like that, viruses, proteins, then you have to get an electron microscope, which are usually pretty expensive. So most labs are not going to have an electron microscope unless they have a few that you can use if you're supervised. So magnification increases images in size. Resolving power is the clarity of the image. So higher magnifications require higher resolving powers. So if you look at this boot, for example, if you enlarge just that one section, you're not gonna see it very clearly. So you'd have to use a higher resolution in order to prevent this pixelation when you enlarge it. So higher magnification needs higher resolving power. The three main types of microscopes that we have are the compound light microscope, the scanning electron microscope, and the transmission electron microscope. The compound light microscope is what you usually see in a lab. And all it does is it puts light going through the specimen and magnifies it so that you can see it. it magnifies up to a thousand times. The scanning electron microscope, as the name implies, it uses electrons but what it does is it scans the surface. So you can actually see a 3D image. You can see the surface of insects or the surface of whatever specimen you're trying to look at. So scanning scans the surface, if you think about it like that. The transmission electron microscope actually allows you to view internal structures. So it transmits the electrons through the specimen so that you can see inside the specimen. This is the strongest of the three microscopes. You can magnify up to 500,000 times. And again, these are the kind of microscopes that you probably have to have supervision in order to be able to use just because they're so expensive. So all cells have three general components. They all have the plasma membrane. They all have cytoplasm and they all have DNA. However, in eukaryotic organisms, the DNA is inside a membrane-bound nucleus. So eukaryotic organisms have a true nucleus. Prokaryotic organisms do not have a true nucleus, and their DNA is found in what's called the nucleoid region. Prokaryotic cells also have what's called a cell wall, but that is not found in all eukaryotes. For example, plants have cell walls and fungi have cell walls, but animals do not have cell walls. So cell walls are only found in prokaryotes and some eukaryotes. So that's not a common feature to all cells. So if you're asked for three common features of cells, it's DNA, cytoplasm, and the plasma membrane. But the DNA is just in different areas between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And we'll talk more about that later. 
So again, bacteria, plants, fungi, and some protists have cell walls. Animal cells do not. Oops, sorry. In bacteria, the cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan, and that is actually what allows you to classify them as gram-positive or gram-negative, the amount of peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Plant cell walls are made of cellulose, which is one of those polysaccharides we talked about last chapter. And fungi are made of chitin, which again is another one of those polysaccharides we talked about last chapter. So DNA are, is contained in your chromosomes. Cytoplasm is contained within the cell. The plasma membrane surrounds the cell, and the cell wall, if present, surrounds the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is actually the barrier between the internal and external environments. It is semi-permeable, which means that it regulates. It regulates nutrients that come in and waste that go out. Not everything can just pass through the plasma membrane. The cytoplasm is the area between the membrane and the nucleus or the nucleoid region. It's watery and it's semi-fluid substance and it suspends the organelles. Your DNA or your chromosomes are your genetic material. This controls the cell's activity. When the cell's ready to divide, the DNA condenses into chromosomes and then your genes are on those chromosomes. And then the cell wall in those specific organisms that we talked about provides structure and helps protect the membrane. What it does is it surrounds that plasma membrane so it helps maintain that shape or rigidity. So prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus and the only organelles they have are ribosomes. Ribosomes make proteins. We have two domains in this prokaryotic area, archaea and bacteria. Remember the third domain is eukarya, and we'll talk about that in a second. Archaea are in more extreme environments, so you're going to find them in really hot places, really acidic places, uh, methane-fueled environments. Bacteria are everywhere. Bacteria, if you've heard the name, it's probably a bacteria. E. coli, Staph aureus, Strep, those are bacteria. If it sounds crazy and you can hardly pronounce it, it's probably archaea. Archaea are actually classified based on where they live. So methanogens live in methane environments. Thermophiles live in hot environments. Acidophiles live in acidic environments. And halophiles live in salty environments. Bacteria are everywhere. Cyanobacteria are actually photosynthetic bacteria that have to live in moist environments. We have some bacteria that live on us and in us. So we have that are called normal flora. Archaea, some are producers or autotrophs. None of them are pathogenic though, so none of them cause diseases. Bacteria, on the other hand, do cause diseases, but they are decomposers, and they can make food and some drugs. So they are still important, even though they can cause diseases. And the cyanobacteria, as I said, are producers, so autotrophs. They make their own food. So they reproduce via asexual binary fission. So one parent, as you can see on the little diagram here. The DNA replicates itself, the cell elongates, and the cell pinches in half basically. So what happens is those two daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent cell. This is advantageous because they can get a lot of offspring out there at once because they just duplicate themselves and pop off a bunch of clones. However, it's, dis it's at a disadvantage too because if something wipes out the parent cell, it's going to wipe out all of the clones as well. Now, a few may survive, and that's where we get resistant bacteria from. But in general, asexual reproduction is really good to get a lot of offspring out there. But again, 
they're genetically identical. So it can be hard if something wipes out the population, which is the point of antibiotics. So here's a prokaryotic cell, generalized. You have the plasma membrane. Oops, sorry. You have the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and the capsule. The plasma membrane is on the innermost layer. The middle layer is the cell wall, and some prokaryotics have an outer capsule. The appendages, you have pili and flagella. Pili are used for attachment, and they're shorter. Sex pili are used for conjugation to exchange genetic material. But flagella are used for motility. Flagella are used like tails to get them from one place to another. The only human cell that has a flagella is the sperm cell. In the cytoplasm, they have ribosomes for protein synthesis, and then there's the nucleoid region, so that's their DNA. It's a circular piece of DNA that's just all coiled up in that area. So basic structures versus appendages versus the cytoplasm. So again, the plasma membrane is a barrier between the internal and external. It's regulatory, so it determines what goes in and out. The cell wall is structural and protects that membrane. And the capsule, not all of them have the capsule, but when they do, it protects the cell from being engulfed or eaten. The appendages, the flagella, again, it's whip-like and it's used for motility, like a tail. The pili are used for attachment and they're hollow tubes. The nucleoid region has that single loop of DNA and ribosomes are for protein synthesis. So eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus and various organelles. They are under the domain eukarya, and the four kingdoms are protista, fungi, plants, and animals. So you look at these cells, and how do you know they're eukaryotic? Because you can see that nucleus. The nucleus is the giant circle that you can see stained. They're about 10 times larger than prokaryotic cells, and they have organelles. Organelles are constantly communicating with each other, and they're called little organs because each one has a specific function. So there are little compartments that are often bound by a membrane in the cytoplasm, and each one does a specific thing. So here's an overview of eukaryotic cells. Again, the three structures that are major, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, organelles, and DNA. The nucleus, contains chromosomes or chromatin. Chromatin is just the DNA in its non-dividing state. It's like spaghetti. It condenses into chromosomes when the cells are ready to divide. The nucleolus, which actually makes ribosomal RNA, so it makes the ribosomes. The nuclear envelope surrounds the nucleus. It's a double membrane that protects it. The nuclear pores allow for messenger RNA to leave the nucleus. The nucleoplasm is just the cytoplasm of the nucleus. As far as ribosomes go, you have free ribosomes or attached ribosomes. They're attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, so it's called the rough ER because it looks like it's rough. And the rough ER and ribosomes in general make proteins. Smooth ER which is on the other side of the rough ER, makes lipids or hormones. The Golgi complex modifies and repackages those cellular products. So the rough ER will ship protein vesicles to the Golgi, and then it'll be modified there. The smooth ER will ship lipids or hormone vesicles to the Golgi, and those will be modified as well. They will then be put into new vesicles and shipped wherever they need to go. Lysosomes actually degrade worn out organelles or waste products or things that we engulf that we don't want. 
Mitochondria generate ATP. Chloroplasts are in plant cells and they function in photosynthesis. The cytoskeleton is made up of three different types of filaments. Microfilaments are the smallest. Those are for contractions and things like that. Intermediate filaments are the intermediate size, and those are structural in nature. And microtubules are the biggest ones, and those are used for movement. They make up flagella and cilia. They make up centrioles and spindle fibers, which are functioning in cell division. They're also used to move things around the cell because motor proteins can attach to them and move things around the cell. So you can see here, the nucleolus is inside of the nucleus. The DNA is inside of the nucleus. The nuclear envelope surrounds it. The nuclear pores are openings. Ribosomes are on top of the rough ER. The Golgi complex will modify the vesicles that come from the ER. Lysosomes contain really powerful hydrolytic enzymes and they break down things that are unwanted. Peroxisomes are very much like lysosomes except that they have oxidative enzymes and they detoxify. So the liver is going to have a lot of peroxisomes. The energy organelles are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are in plant cells only. Mitochondria are in both plant and animal cells. The cytoskeleton again, microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. So microtubules make up flagella and cilia and centrioles. And microfilaments are for like movement. And then intermediate filaments are more structural. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you have an animal cell. On the right-hand side of the screen, you have a plant cell. So notice the plant cell has chloroplasts. The animal cell does not. Okay. So the nucleus is the largest organelle. We can see it using that compound light microscope. It's the control center. It contains the hereditary information that is passed on from generation to generation. It's primarily composed of DNA. As I've already said, chromatin is thin and stringy. It looks like spaghetti, almost invisible. When it's ready to divide, though, it condenses into chromosomes, and that's what you can visibly see. It stores genetics information and dictates the cell's activity, so it's like the boss. It's surrounded by a nuclear envelope, which is a double membrane that has pores. Nucleoplasm is the semi-fluid matrix that bathes the chromatin. And the nucleolus is that round thing in the middle where ribosomal RNA is manufactured. So ribosomes are made there. Ribosomes function in protein synthesis. So DNA is going to transcribe a piece of messenger RNA, which will then be translated into a protein. It has two subunits, a small and a large, and it's composed of RNA. As I said, they're made in the nucleus, and they can be found free in the cytoplasm in groups which are called polyribosomes or attached to the rough ER. The endomembrane system is just a series of membranous organelles that are involved in transport within the cell. So it's the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough and the smooth, the Golgi apparatus, and then the vesicles that are transported from the Golgi. So again, the smooth ER makes lipids and hormones, packages them up and sends them to the Golgi. The rough ER makes proteins, packages them up, and sends them to the Golgi. Then the Golgi modifies these proteins, hormones, and lipids and makes sure that they are correct. And then if they are, they will package them up and transport them wherever they need to go. Lysosomes, again, are hydrolytic enzymes. They degrade waste 
worn out organelles and things we generally don't want in the cell. Peroxisomes have oxidative enzymes that detoxify and neutralize free radicals. So the endoplasmic reticulum is actually an extension of the nuclear envelope. It is a channel and network of tubules and flattened sacs that are kind of on top of each other. The rough ER is studded with ribosomes. The hence has a rough appearance and that's why it's called the rough ER. It makes and transports proteins within vesicles. The smooth ER has smooth appearance because it's not studded with ribosomes. And again, it makes and transports non-proteins, lipids, and hormones within the vesicles. So the ER membrane pinches off and forms these transport vesicles that contain their product. They're then transported to the Golgi where the product is further modified. Then the cell product is either used by the cell or secreted by secretory vesicles via exocytosis. In exocytosis, the secretory vesicle just goes to the plasma membrane, fuses with it, and lets its product out. The Golgi is a stack of flattened sacs, looks like a stack of pancakes. Again, it receives the transport vesicles from the ER. It modifies the cell products and then repackages them into secretory vesicles and then sends them wherever they need to go. So it's like the post office. It makes sure that you have the right postage, it makes sure that you have the right packaging, and it makes sure you have the right zip code so it sends it where it needs to go. Vesicles are small membranous sacs. Lysosomes are present in animal cells only. They have powerful hydrolytic enzymes and they're the cleanup crew. If your lysosomes are faulty, you have what's called Tay-Sachs disease and unfortunately it is deadly and the children usually die by the age of five because what happens is the lysosomes can't break things down so they get a buildup of lipids in their brain, unfortunately. Peroxisomes are the other type. They have oxidative enzymes that detoxify and break down organic molecules into peroxide, hydrogen peroxide. If you have ALD, they are faulty. And there was a movie called Lorenzo's Oil that kind of spotlighted this disorder. Peroxisomes are very complex in function but the point is to detoxify everything. So if your peroxisomes are not working, you'll have a buildup and poison yourself, basically. Vacuoles are large membranous sacs that are not associated with the endomembrane system. Contractile vacuoles are in protozoa, which are animal-like protists, basically. They are used for water regulation, so if too much water builds up, they will contract and squeeze the water out. Digestive vacuoles are for food processing, and the large central vacuoles in plants, and that stores water, nutrients, waste, and enzymes. So the large central vacuole is another thing that plants have that animals do not. So chloroplasts, a cell wall, and large central vacuoles plant cells have, animal cells do not. Animal cells have lysosomes and centrioles, and plant cells do not. So energy-related organs specialize in converting energy so that we can use it for growth, pair, reproduction, metabolism, basically everything. So solar energy is the ultimate source of energy. Autotrophs use photosynthesis to convert that solar energy to chemical energy, and that happens within the chloroplasts. Then respiration in the mitochondria creates ATP. So we convert that chemical energy into usable energy. So the equations you can see, carbon dioxide plus water, in the presence of light gives you a carbohydrate and oxygen as a byproduct. Remember that CH2O N is the common thing for 
uh, carbohydrate because the ratio is one to two to one, carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Respiration starts with the end products of photosynthesis. So a carbohydrate plus oxygen gives off carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. And we'll talk more about cellular respiration in another chapter. And we'll talk about photosynthesis in another chapter. So comparing chloroplasts and mitochondria, chloroplasts are photosynthesis, mitochondria respiration. Chloroplasts contain chlorophyll. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Chloroplasts are present in eukaryotic autotrophs, not cyanobacteria. So not bacterial autotrophs, just plants and algae. Mitochondria are present in both plant and animal cells. They're in all eukaryotic cells, basically. The structures in the chloroplast are the thylakoids. They're collectively called grana, and that's where the first stage of photosynthesis occurs. And then the stroma is the fluid center, and that's where the second stage of photosynthesis occurs. And like I said, more details about photosynthesis will come later. Mitochondria have two things. The cristae are those inner membrane folds, and the matrix is the fluid center. And we'll talk more about respiration in another chapter as well. So chloroplasts, photosynthesis, autotrophs that are eukaryotic, contain chlorophyll. The thylakoids are the membranes, stroma is the fluid, mitochondria, respiration, ATP generation, all eukaryotic cells have them, two structures, the cristae are the folds, the matrix is the fluid. Okay. All right. So mitochondria are numerous in cells that require a lot of energy. So your heart, for example, your heart requires a lot of energy because it's always got to be pumping. So your heart will have a lot of mitochondria. Okay, the theory, the theory of endosymbiosis basically attempts to explain the origin of eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic cells. Symbiosis is a mutualistic relationship between two organisms that live together. So the endosymbiosis theory suggests that these energy-related organelles, chloroplasts and mitochondria, were once free-living prokaryotes that were engulfed by a host cell. So they lived together, one inside the other. So basically, a prokaryote was free-living. These chloroplasts and mitochondria were free-living. So this one bigger prokaryote engulfed the mitochondria, and those became eukaryotic cells. Other free-living prokaryotes engulfed both the chloroplasts and mitochondria, so those became autotrophic eukaryotic cells. So all cells that are eukaryotic contain mitochondria. Plant cells, autotrophic eukaryotic cells contain those chloroplasts. So the benefit for that prokaryote was protection and survival. They lived inside of this larger cell, so they were protected. The host cell benefited because these are the energy organelles. So energy was provided for them. So it benefited both the prokaryotic cells, that the one that engulfed each other, the host cell, and the smaller prokaryotes. Things that support this, both chloroplasts and mitochondria have a double membrane. So they could have been engulfed and not destroyed. They both contain their own DNA, so they can replicate. As a matter of fact, mitochondrial DNA might be something that you've heard of. Mitochondrial DNA comes from our mothers. We have the same exact mitochondrial DNA as our mothers do. And the reason is that when the sperm penetrates the egg, the mitochondria fall off. So that's why we don't have our father's mitochondrial. But mitochondrial DNA can actually be used in forensics and criminal investigations if regular nuclear DNA isn't available. You can use mitochondrial DNA to compare. Chloroplasts and mitochondria can both make proteins because they have ribosomes and they're similar in size as the prokaryotes. So we have a lot of supportive data for this theory. 
Okay, the cytoskeleton is comprised of proteins. You can compare it to the musculoskeletal system because they function in movement and structure. Movement within the cells or the entire cell, and they help maintain shape and provide cellular support. So as I said earlier, we have three different types. Microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Microfilaments are also called the actin filaments, and those are thin and flexible, and they function in muscle contraction. Intermediate filaments are kind of rope-like, and they function in structural support. And microtubules are hollow cylinders that make up cilia, flagella, centrioles, and also are the highways within the cells. So motor proteins can actually walk along the microtubules and take things where they need to go. So as I said, flagella, which are the long whip-like projections, the tails that allow for motility. Cilia are short hair-like projections that allow for movement, usually across surfaces. So our respiratory system, for example, has a lot of cilia to keep things moving through our respiratory tract. And then centrioles are in animal cells. They organize the spindle fiber during cell division. So prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. Prokaryotic are archaea or bacteria. Eukaryotic are eukarya. Within eukarya, we have protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. DNA in a prokaryotic cell is a single loop in the nucleoid region. Eukaryotic cells, you have chromosomes in the nucleus. Prokaryotic cells only have ribosomes. Eukaryotic cells have various organelles. Prokaryotic cells are smaller and more simple. Eukaryotic are larger and more complex. Prokaryotic cells are unicellular, and eukaryotic cells are mostly multicellular, except the kingdom protista. Those are mostly unicellular. And then the comparison of animal versus plant cells. Plant cells have a cell wall, chloroplast, and a large central vacuole. The cell wall supports and protects, made of cellulose. Chloroplast is where photosynthesis occurs, and that large central vacuole stores stuff. Animal cells have lysosomes and centrioles that plant cells do not have. Lysosomes are the cleanup mechanism, so digestive in function, so anything we don't want, they'll degrade. Centrioles are associated with cell division. We're not really sure exactly if that's the extent of it, but we know that much. Shape of animal cells are round. The shape of plant cells are rectangular. So you can look at this and is an animal or plant and how do you know? Well, the first thing you wanna do is look at shape. The one on the right side is rounder than the one on the left side. So that could tell you animal on the right side, plant on the left. But also look at the plant cell there. You can see the chloroplasts, you can see the cell wall, and you can see that large central vacuole. So that tells you that's a plant. Those are not existent on the other cell. But on that cell, you can see the centrioles, and you can see lysosomes, which are not present on the other cell. So you can tell that the right side is a plant, I mean an animal cell, and the left side is a plant cell. So the common organelles that both plants and animals have, they both have a nucleus, which is the control center. They both have smooth and rough ER. They both have mitochondria. They both have ribosomes. And they both have a Golgi complex. So in general, you should be able to tell the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Know the cell structures and their functions, especially those organelles and compare and contrast what plant cells have that animal cells don't and what animal cells have that plant cells don't. So that is it for now. We will talk again for the next chapter. Bye.